Good evening. Welcome to another edition of Native Voice TV. I'm Sundas Martinez. And I'm Siwapili Rose Amador. And together we are Native Voice TV. We are the indigenous people. Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, what's new? What's new? We have some really good um, news, I guess. It's exciting news. Yeah, very exciting news for both of us. Uh, we got a stipend award, and I'm going to let you explain this. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so you can go ahead and talk. Actually, we got now. a stipend award to attend <clears throat> the NAJA conference in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is a Native American journalist association. Yes. And since we represent the, uh, the television media, we're going to be attending that conference, and it uh, should be pretty exciting because... Oh, definitely, yeah. I'm looking, I'm looking forward for this. Yeah, it's going to be... Really exciting, especially they're, meeting all the different media people. They're going to have a lot of different workshops on um, mascotting and integrating television with um, the internet, which is something we're looking at yeah, doing in the future because exactly. we'd like to have the shows on the internet so people who don't live in our uh, viewing area can still see. Oh yeah, then we have the a show. wider, you know, worldwide. Right. Anything. So yeah. hopefully we'll learn how to do that, and also you know how to produce for PBS and. Um, ethics, legal issues, oh, yeah. broadcasting. Exactly. So it should be fun and it's always nice to meet other native people from across the country and, and you know you run into people at different events and it's... Yeah you never know what could what, what could conspire you know this one person has something that you need or, or we have something that they need or... Sure you know, it's a, it's a great network but yeah. as I say it's always um, interesting who you meet different places you know and yeah. You know, I was on uh, one of the picket lines you know, a few months back with <laughs> my dog, <laughs> and I ran into a very, very interesting woman. And who was that? And it's my pleasure to introduce... <laughs> it's our pleasure. Hi, our pleasure, Lakota Hardin, who I ran into on the, I believe it was the Calpine picket line a few months back. So head on? welcome. <laughs> I think awesome. it was dancing welcome. to the drums, right? Uh, yeah. That's it. Over in the corner or something. Well, Lakota, you're quite a lady, and I, I read your bio, and um, I needed my glasses because there was so much, and I didn't know where to start. But tell, start with telling us what tribes you represent. Well, that's a, a big question because of where I come from. Mm -hmm. First of all, my name, Lakota, was given to me by my grandmother who just recently made her transition uh, last month. Um, I was born in the 50s at a time when people were calling us the Sioux Indians and mm -hmm. the way that we were being acculturated and assimilated into this society. Uh, they, they were taking away our language, ta you know, doing all these things, chopping everything, chopping our names in half. Mm -hmm. um, and so she said, we're not the Sioux. That's not even from our, our, our tongue, from our words. We're Lakota people, and it means allies. And we were so big, there were so many of us across the whole plains that there were different um, nations within the nation. So there's Dakota, Lakota, Nakota. So she wanted me to know that because she was afraid that we were going to lose everything. And luckily, you know, with our family the way we were, of course, not too long after that, um, in the American New Movement was formed, and uh, I was raised in an AIM family, and um, as a young person, kept the knowledge that I got from my great 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 grandmother, who was her name was Agnes. When she was 98, I was seven, and I used to get to listen to her talk mm -hmm. about pre-invasion, about the time when we were still free. So, with those elements involved, I think that um, I was given the responsibility at a young age to mm -hmm. be able to represent my family and they always said what tribe are you you know and I'd say I'm Minikoji and Yankton Lakota you know Minikoji and Yankton Lakota because that's on my mother's side mm -hmm. I wasn't raised by my father my biological father who's at the time was known as Winnebago and then you know as the language came back we're actually Ho-Chungra or known as Ho-Chunk mm -hmm. relocated from Wisconsin to mm -hmm. Nebraska so that was my father's side but then my father who raised me my mother when I was young, also moved to Alaska. Ah. And I was raised by uh, island people, which is a very different way. You know, all our tribes, there's so many different uh, valuable things about each of us, and it has to do with a lot of where we come from. Mm -hmm. And the island people are very different because we're more contained. You know, you have to have those kinship yeah. ways in place because you're on an island. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and that respect of, you know, I think about in the old days, 
when you know the the carvings on the paddles and and in the Clinket people and all the other island tribes you know showed who you were the totem poles and everything um, showed who you were so that people could see you coming and they'd say oh that's so-and-so's from that clan and from uh -huh. this you know from this place and where the water meets the this uh -huh. you know they could tell just by looking at your your, your regalia and uh, so I was raised Deshitan clan which is a raven beaver clan and I was uh, Kaguantan Yetki which is uh, daughter of Kaguantan which was my father and um, mm -hmm. and so that taught me a lot of who I am and the way that my father knew the ocean waters the way he knew when we'd be tr fishing you know we'd be playing on the boat and he'd say pull it up three you know so we'd get our lines and pull up three <laughs> arm lengths yeah. lower it seven and he had no equipment he just knew the bottom of the ocean wow. mm -hmm. you know and so that kind of knowledge that our that our parents had that our ancestors had you know just by acknowledging them uh, when we say who we are. I always acknowledge uh, my father who's also Clinket. Mm -hmm. And then I've also been, as an adult, got adopted by a Quechua family here in the Bay Area. And so I always say I'm adopted Quechua too because it helped me, this family that I embraced, who embraced me when I first moved here, who were also um, and then adopted Lakota way, they also become Lakota themselves. Um, they taught me how to be, um, I guess, urban for lack of a better mm -hmm. word, you know, how to negotiate, how to navigate in this modern traditional society. So. And you were raised in an AIM, American Indian Movement family. That must have been an experience. <laughs> yeah, I think that, um, you know, people talk about PTSD. I think we all, that's kind of been the main thing. We talk about the trauma, the post-traumatic stress disorder mm -hmm. of invasion, yeah. mm -hmm. of annihilation, of all of this stuff, you know, all the, the loss of mm -hmm. memory, of tearing apart our families, of every everything. I have this poem and I wish I would have brought it with me, you know, says we are not no longer alone because every single race of people that I've talked to or had uh, communications with and they talked about the concentration camps or the genocide or um, the internment camps here, mm -hmm. or the slavery, or the abuses. We've been through all that. So there wasn't anything that I heard that would shock me, because indigenous people here went through all of those things. In fact, right. mm -hmm. Hitler did model his camps based on reservations, right? Yeah, he said that in his book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So for, for me growing up in an AIM family, it was not a choice. It wasn't something that we decided, oh, I think we'll be Indian. You know, right. <laughs> it's kind of like, wait a minute, this is what they're doing to us and what are we going to do uh -huh. about it, you know? And so as a kid, you know, we knew what, no other way. And like I said, because of those teachings from my great-grandmother Agnes and my, excuse me, my great-great-grandmother Agnes and then my great-grandmother Mabel, who also kept me when I was little, because I was in boarding school, I went through that mm -hmm. uh, trauma also. For us, now being the adults uh, who were AIM youth at one point, we have our own PTSD of being raised in a movement. And we never thought of it that way because we were just kids like anything, That's even right. in boarding school. Yeah, we were being oppressed and the priests and nuns were statists, you know, and did horrible things to us, but we were all together. We were a bunch of Indian kids having fun together. Mm -hmm. We all got in trouble together, you know, so there was a lot of camaraderie around that. And I think that's the same with being an AIM kid. Um, but the trauma around that is our families were always under attack. It's not like it is nowadays. People say AIM and it's a t-shirt and selling right, t-shirts right, and right. you know everyone wants to be Indian. It wasn't like that in the early 70s. People, our own people especially, were ashamed of us. Mm -hmm. They're the militants, they're the, the radicals. radicals, we're the good guys, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And we got attacked a lot by our own people even. And you what could tell- What one event stands out? I'm sure you went through an awful lot, but is there one event that stands out in your mind through that whole, you know, um, growing up in, in the movement like that? <clears throat> I think <clears throat> it's not so much events as much as ways of being. Mm -hmm. uh, and an example is um, when the FBI would be on, on our reservation in Pine Ridge, they call it the siege of terror, right? When, you, mm -hmm. when people refer to that time in the 70s, um, right after Wounded Knee, and people were being kidnapped and people were being killed, you know, mm -hmm. unmarked graves all over the res. You'd find people missing, you know, and then you'd find them later. So we all had to be aware and, you know, like just the way of hearing a gunshot and we'd hit the floor immediately as little kids. I mean, that's part of what we did, but we also 
had, how do I say this, um, others on our side, like running down the road and hearing hoofs of a horse. You can't see the horse, it's the horse spirit, but you know what's there with you. Mm -hmm. Or um, the fog coming in and then you get disoriented and you think you're lost and you come out at a place and um, you think, God, we were lost for a long time. And then you find out later that the way you were going, the feds did have a roadblock there and were taking people. Uh -huh. And somehow we got lost in the fog and we came out the other side and made yeah. it to where we were going. So the fog helped us to get where we were going. So we give thanks to that fog, mm -hmm. you know. So when I met the fog here, when I moved to the Bay Area, <laughs> I was like, oh, there was no thunder, there was no lightning, you know, because it come from the thunder beings, you know. And I was thinking, where's, I'm, I'm lonely without the thunder and the lightning. And all of a sudden there's the fog. So I made relation with the fog. So welcome. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's more what I remember is the way that we thought the way that we felt, the way that when you saw other Indians, it didn't matter, well, if they had long hair, that was the, if they had short shaved hair, you're like, watch out. But if they had long <laughs> hair, you know, you'd be like, hey, brother, sister, and everybody had that. Every time you saw an Indian, you immediately made that connection. Now, do you think that uh, part of this post-traumatic syndrome, have you come to the realization that were some things in your life as an adult you were doing that was part of this trauma but then you carried it on to your children or your grandkids and then come to the realization, well, I need to stop this because it was something that I was learned or taught or conditioned and now I need to stop it. Well, Have I you... think in my, <clears throat> in my case in particular, I've done a lot of work mm -hmm. in my adult life. The thing I think that has been most unique about me and others who are like me is that because of AIM, because of Leonard Crow Dog and Wallace Black Elk and all those old medicine men who kept our ways intact, mm -hmm. who went through major suffering, you know, having to be hidden from the authorities, having to be ridiculed by other kids, you know, they kept those traditional ways and those original ceremonies intact. So for me growing up in AIM and watching all my uncle sun dancing every year and going into the sweat lodge, those things that weren't common for people and are more common now, but back then mm -hmm. there wasn't yeah, uh, Sundance on every corner like there is now. Yeah. And because of that, I took it very seriously because my uncles taught me, you know, my mm -hmm. aunts taught me, my grandmas taught me that this is not a hobby. I mean, we never thought that way. It's, it's your life. It's, way it's the life, way, yeah. it's the reason we're still here. So at a young age, you know, as a teenager, I, I did, I, you know, they said, you carry this pipe, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't, you know. And right at that's right at the party age, right? <laughs> and it was tough <laughs> those first couple style. years, you know. Oh, everybody was trying to be cool, and they're saying, "Let's ditch, let's ditch Lakota," you know, because I was the only sober <laughs> She's person. No fun. Yeah, and I'd say, "I'm still fun, even though you know." But I think that that's that was where I started in looking at. It was real easy for me to stop because all I could see from alcohol. I mean, I partied in high school like everybody else, but I lived in Alaska, yeah. where it was an actual you know party. <laughs> When I come to the res and see the, some of the things I saw was so heartbreaking, I could not participate. And I saw this is the genocide yeah. that we're inflicting on ourselves when we pick up that alcohol. And that's all part of that. And that's what yeah. changed. And then because of that, I thought, well, where are the sober people? Okay, well, there's AA, there's Al-Anon. I started getting involved. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized in Al-Anon, this was the bit, that was the, one of the main things that really shook my thinking was, it's not me saying, look at him, he's drinking, look how bad he is. It's mm -hmm. like, look at me, what a victim I've become. Yeah. You know, and I thought, wait a minute, I'm responsible for what happens in my life. I create my life. It's breaking the chains that bind you. And, and then bind, I've yeah. used every single way possible to me, you know, mm -hmm. that I see, is this going to help me to heal? Is this going to help us to heal? And that became my, my life's mm -hmm. work. And hopefully, you know, sitting with my kids and saying, you know, when they were seven and eight, saying, I'm not sure how to do this because when I was seven and eight, I was in a boarding school where the nuns and priests used to whip us. Yeah. So I'm not sure how to do this. What would you do if you were the mom? Or even how to give love to your children or anything oh, like I, that. Oh, my mom was really good at that. That's good. That's the one thing I had was she hugged us all the time. She mm -hmm. constantly, t she made us tell, me and my brothers and sisters, tell, and we had to hold hands and say, you know, Travis, you're my brother and I love you. And we hated it, you know, when you're <laughs> seven and eight, right? But we, she made us do stuff like that. And I'm really grateful. I That's had an amazing mother, really amazing mother. And um, seems like she came to the realization too, where she needs to yeah. push the family together instead yeah. of being pulled apart. 
Yeah, she she did one thing too that was different for the from the rest of my family was she moved away from the reservation. Mm -hmm. And she showed me other ways of being. So I had this dual existence where mm -hmm. one minute we're protesting on Mount Rushmore, being dragged down a hill by the cops, you know, and then the next week I'm in Alaska marching in the Alaska Day Parade <laughs> with my baton, and, you know, <laughs> you know, so it was like she wanted me to have, you know, some kind of um, choices. Yeah. And, and always saying, because in that situation in Alaska, it was all white school, predominantly yeah. white. And I'd overhear them saying things about the natives and mm -hmm. I go crying to her and she says, well, you just got to do things twice as good as they do. Yeah. And you can, you are, you know? So I always knew that. I always knew inside of me that I was smart enough. I was smarter than. And very talented. Things. You're a poet, you're an actress. <laughs> I mean, you have, now you're a modern traditionalist. Explain well, that's kind to of, us. that's kind of what I, one thing I saw part of the genocide and part of the colonization, especially with the trauma that all of our tribes went through. I always say that it was like a bomb dropped and we got scattered in so many different pieces of shrapnel. Mm -hmm. And some has to have the, the look of being Indian. Mm -hmm. Some still have the language. Some d don't have those things, you know, but they have mm -hmm. the desire to have those things. Mm -hmm. Whereas maybe some of us who have those things didn't appreciate it enough. I give credit to my, the Brat family. I uh, grew up with this way, you know, with this traditional way. And I always had it. It's like having this water. You drink water, you take it for granted. When you go without water in a ceremony, <laughs> boy, every time you pick this up, you say, thank you, yeah. you know, thank you for this water. Well, that's kind of what my brother Peter did for me, you know, when he picked up this way and we became relatives. He showed me, look at how valuable this is. Look how powerful this is. And not saying it, but just by the way he viewed it, the way True. he felt. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah, yeah, we do have, yeah, we're pretty cool. You know, I started mm -hmm. to feel mm -hmm. this pride that I hadn't had before. You know, I thought I did. Mm -hmm. It's like you don't know until you, you don't know what daylight is until you open the, and see the daylight, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so I think that that's being, you know, trying to be a modern traditionalist, being, people would say, when they get into this way, we see a lot of people returning and we, we had a joke, we'd call people super sacred, you know, because mm -hmm. they were raised in their urban setting or away from the people, right? Yeah. And they come back to the community and all of a sudden, if you sneeze, it's a sign, you know, <laughs> if this bush blows, it's a sign, you know, and everything's super sacred. Um, so we would see people come and go, some stay, some yeah. they're really sincere and others that they're just looking for something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I asked the spirits one time, I said, why, you know, I was cleaning houses for a living when I first got here. I was a student at Cal and I saw our sacred Chanupa on the walls of all these rich people. And I said, how can you let them do that to our ways? And I said, well, anything that you put time and prayer into when you put these things together in our ceremonies, they have power, that it's built by the way that you treat them and carry them. If you put something up on a wall and forget about it, it loses everything. Yeah. It becomes a piece of wood and a piece of stone. Just a decoration. Yeah, mm -hmm. just a decoration. Mm -hmm. So they're not taking anything from you. Right. So then it, it helped me to relax and to understand some of the ways of being mm -hmm. a modern, you know, like my daughter, she wanted to dye her hair and she wanted to have lightning bolts shaved in the back, you know, mm -hmm. and this was back in the early 80s or mid 80s. and. So we had a compromise there. The front part of her hair pulled up and she had to leave that normal. The back, she could dye it, she could <laughs> shave it, she could do all this stuff, it was the green. The front was yours, was the back was hers. Yeah, so when we went to ceremony, she put her hair down. Uh, she looked like a young Lakota woman. But at school, she could put it up and she had all these wild ways of being. That's a traditional Lakota woman. You know, it's like we do what we need to, to respect our elders, to respect each other, to respect ourselves. And yet we still get to partake in all this. Sitting Bull said that in that famous saying, when you walk down the road of this, this foreigner, you know, if you see something good, pick it up and use it. If you don't, if it's not good, leave it alone. He didn't say destroy it. See, that's the problem with this society yeah, is they right. destroy exactly. what they don't understand. Well, this, they also destroy what they don't want rather than giving it to someone. Or letting it I, be in case somebody else I've needs I've seen it. that so many times. Hey, that's that's a good unit, but we don't need this. Destroy it. Go break it. Yep, yep, uh, yep. It, exactly. It's a shame. You could give it to someone. That's true. So I have a question for you. Um, as a you know, Lakota living in this this area here, 
What message would you have for the youth? Um, what, are, what do you think the youth, the youth are lacking and what do you think that they need to do to um, honor themselves and honor their family and their, their elders? I think the most important thing that I would say to our youth is I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry that you have to live in the conditions that you live in. That we live in a place where everything that comes at you is telling you that you're not right, that you're not good, that you're not good enough. And I want to say to you that you are. That no matter the lies that come at you, no matter what the authorities say, no matter what anybody who doesn't understand us says to you, it's a lie. That deep inside, all your ancestors are still with you. They're in your blood. All you have to do is sit and listen to them. Ask these trees, ask this wind, ask the sun that comes up in the morning, ask this water when you take a drink that, you know, help me to get back who I know I really am because I'm good. I've survived genocide. <laughs> They've come at me in every direction, tore apart my families, degraded us, took everything away from us, and we're still here. We are so powerful because we have that connection. This Unchimaka knows us. Our people have been in this area for centuries with, before these borders and these pinchy languages that they separate us with. You know, we knew this. This land knows us. This wind, when it comes in, it knows you. This rain, when it comes, it knows you. And say thank you because we don't say thank you. And if we don't say thank you, it goes away from us. And we notice it's getting hotter. The rain, rain's going away from us. You know, we need to start paying homage again. When that sun comes up in the morning and says, saying, oh man, you know, where's, where's my Coca-Cola or where's my Starbucks? Say, thank you for coming and giving us another day. Just that one thing, when you take your drink of water, thank you for nourishing my body, for being here, refreshing me. You know, someone gives you something else, thank you. Thank you, sister, thank you, brother. Thank you, uncle, thank you, auntie. You know, even if they, you don't know them, they're still your auntie and your uncle, your, your tia and your tio. That's what I want to say, because you already have all that knowledge inside of you. You just have to pay attention to it, make time for it. Turn off the iPod for a while. Go for a walk, talk to that water. Go to the ocean, talk to that water. Help me out here. And if you can't get there, then go to a rooftop. Go to a little p part of the grass. Say, you know, Aunt, grandfather, grandmother, help me out. Wow, I'm ready for that. Message. Yeah, that's good. Well, thank you. Uh, you promised to come back in November. We will have her back, we <laughs> promise. Uh, but w they can hear you on the radio on KPFA on what days and what? Well, on Wednesdays, 94.1, or okay. you, anywhere in the world, you can go to kpfa.org, kpfa.org, okay, cool. and go to Bay Native Circle. We're on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock. You go to the programs page, click on Bay Native Circle. It takes you, you can listen to any of our shows since the beginning show in 2004. Wow. April of 2004. That's so you can impressive. go back and oh, listen to all great. the shows So that's anytime. the integration of the uh, radio yes, with the really The modern nice. traditional uh, that's smoke wonderful. signal, I guess. And how long have you been on the radio? For two years, over two and a half years, I think now. That's you great. Know, we're going to have yeah. to do an inter inter exchange here. We're going to have to go on your show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll have to do that. I've got yeah. about three or four shows coming up here, so yeah. we can do that. So. Well, that's great. We look forward to having you back, and there's so much more we want to talk to you about, because you're an actress, and you said you're, you've done I a do lot. the vagina monologues every year, and I used to travel oh, with, wow. I used yeah. to dance with the Dance Brigade, which is a Bay Area uh, women's dance company. We went on tour um, in 92, especially. We went all over doing Living on the Edge of the World, Goodbye Columbus. Wow. And um, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful place to be. And I just want to say that um, I'm new to San Jose, so thank you for having me here. It's been uh, kind of lonely, you know. Well, it's I don't San know. Jose's game to have you here. Yeah, and we're just exactly. going to have to drag whenever, her out to here. Whenever you need us for anything yeah. or have any questions, give us a call. Well, thank you. Appreciate and that. Thank you so much for all the work Appreciate you've done it. over the years. It's just been. I know it's a lot of work, you know, because oh, I grew up with an activist family as well, and you just, you live it. You live it. And yeah. It's, yeah, it's a way of life. And it's, the thing is, it's about not what people see around you, it's what your ancestors see. Uh -huh. yeah. Ultimately, what's, what goes on in here and how we see ourselves. So yeah. I think that's um, my, my, my move to San Jose is more of a personal healing. Um, I have a very special friend that's really helping me with that. His that's name's good. Ronnie. 
And I think that it's really um, made a difference mm -hmm. to take that time. That's the other thing is we got to take time for ourselves. Exactly. I think as activists or as Indian people, we do have such a responsibility that, you know, sometimes we forget about You're taking right. care of ourselves. You gotta eat right, stay away from the <laughs> sugar. <laughs> No yeah. French fries. <laughs> no French fries. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you for no, promise to come back. So I yeah, know our audience too. will be looking forward to uh, seeing you soon. And, and we'll uh, announce we it when we get close to it, too. That's right. Yeah. We have some okay. announcements coming up. No announcements? No. We don't have time? Oh, my no. goodness. We ran out of time. Wow, well, that's what happens. So thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Good show. Thank you.